Elections on Thursday will bring you what's known as the 10-minute rule. This procedure allows a member to introduce a bill and speak about it for 10 minutes. The same amount of time is then permitted for anyone who wishes to oppose it. Although these bills almost never are enacted, the process allows members to discuss issues of concern. This specific 10-minute rule deals with the language used in some commercial contracts. We now have a 10-minute rule motion, Mr. Giles Brandreth. I have no problem with the technology, Madam Speaker, nor with the amplification. I beg to move that uh, leave be given to bring in a bill to secure improvements to the language and layout of certain contracts. Uh, language, Madam Speaker, is what distinguishes the human race. It is the uh, characteristic that sets us apart, that makes us unique. As an ardent animal lover, Madam Speaker, even I have to acknowledge that uh, however eloquently a dog may bark, he cannot tell you that his parents were poor but honest. Language <laughs> makes us unique. And in this country, we are born with the privilege of having as our parent tongue a unique language, English the richest language in the history of humanity. Our language is rich precisely because it isn't pure. Emerson called it the sea which receives tributaries from every region under heaven. It's the language of Chaucer and the, and the King James Bible, of Keats and Joyce and Anthony Trollope and Anthony Burgess. It has taken 2,000 years, Madam Speaker, to reach this far. And where is it now in 1992? Let me show you, Madam Speaker, let me show you by quoting from the terms of sale offered by the excellent builders merchants, Juson Limited. If, and to the extent that any person by whom the seller has been supplied with the goods supplied here under, here and after referred to as a supplier, validly excludes, restricts, or limits his liability to the seller in respect of the said goods or any loss or damage arising in connection therewith, the liability of the seller to the buyer in respect of the said goods or of any loss or damage arising in connection therewith shall be correspondingly excluded, restricted, or limited. <laughs> there you have it, Madam Speaker, the, the English language today. And that was just five lines out of over 100 similar lines that feature on the back of the Jusen's delivery note. When the driver drops off the breeze blocks and says, sign here, gov, uh, what I've just read out to you is 5% of what you are agreeing to. Whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not. Now, Madam Speaker, does it matter, yes? I believe it does, because it can't be good that people regularly sign contracts that they don't understand, and indeed are not meant to understand. Uh, this is quite... <laughs> as, it, as it happens, I have and I understood it, but I can understand it might be a little sophisticated for my honourable uh, honorable gentleman opposite. <laughs> But the rest of this is in plain English, so he'll be totally at home. Costly mistakes can be made. A constituent of mine discovered this when he signed an incomprehensible contract to lease a photocopier. When he wanted to change the copier, he found himself faced with the option of a so-called settlement charge of some £10,000, which was three times the value of the original equipment, or the prospect of leasing that equipment, whose lifetime, according to the manufacturer, was three years, for a total of seven years. Now, none of this was clear from the contract, whose wording was deliberately obfuscatory and arcane. Translation will come later. <laughs> <laughs> this plain language bill, Madam Speaker, is designed to encourage the use of clear, plain language in commercial contracts and prevent the unscrupulous or the arrogant or the incompetent from hiding behind legalese, jargon, gobbledygook or small print. The Act would apply to consumer contracts, Consumer credit contracts? Think of the confusion that uh, we'd all be spared if we understood the small print that comes with our access cards. And um, housing contracts. And the plain language that I have in mind is not so much the language of Shakespeare as the language of Dickens. Not William Shakespeare, but Jeffrey Dickens. Yes. <laughs> Clear, no-nonsense language that says what it means and means what it says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah.
language that is indeed a lean, mean fighting machine. Of course... <laughs> Madam Speaker, a plain law language might appear to be a contradiction in terms because uh, isn't it the law and lawyers who are responsible for much of the gobbledygook to be found in written contracts? I, I believe I'm right, Madam Speaker, that in 1595, an English Chancellor chose to make an example of a particularly wordy document filed in his court. He ordered a hole to be cut in the centre of the document, all 120 pages of it, and then he had the author's head stuffed through this hole. The offender was then led around Westminster Hall, a hundred yards from where we are now, even a hundred meters, madam, uh, and uh, as an example to all and sundry. Uh, alas, that Elizabethan lesson did not stick, and, and that is where I come in. Four centuries later, but not a moment too soon. I am proposing that the contracts covered by my bill should be written in clear and readily understandable language, using words with common and everyday meanings, be arranged in a logical order, be suitably divided into paragraphs and headings, be clearly laid out and be easily legible. Yeah. It isn't asking much, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you, Madam Speaker, might well ask, why do people sign contracts they don't understand? Often, of course, it's because they are in no position to negotiate. Most consumer contracts are in standard form, are drawn up by the supplier and offered on a take it or leave it basis. Well, this new bill will help these consumers. It'll also help business too, because those that have uh, taken voluntary steps in this direction have uh, seen that uh, uh, clear contracts have advantages. Intelligible contracts promote customers' trust, loyalty, encourage consumers to stick to their contracts and achieve savings in management and staff time. The new law would encourage better practice and if necessary, uh, it would enforce it, although the sanctions I'm proposing are, are moderate ones. The experience in the United States is that a plain language law like this would immediately improve practice and standards. But if a contract did not comply with the act, the party who made the contract in the course of business would be liable to an action for damages brought by the other party. So there's something in this for the lawyers as well. <laughs> uh, that said, there's no question of any form of criminal penalty. Offending contracts wouldn't be void, unenforceable or voidable. I do propose compensation for a consumer who can show actual loss and in certain cases, a small sum of additional damages, and as backup, an extension of the existing powers of the Director General of Fair Trading to deal directly with businesses that ignore the new law. I believe, Madam Speaker, in conclusion, that uh, the case for such a law is overwhelming. Clear, coherent, easy to read consumer contracts bring advantages to consumers and to business. But the signs of voluntary implementation are a bit piecemeal. And I believe that, as in the United States, the chief merit of this uh, new law would be its impetus for change. Alas, it's only legislation which will prompt businesses to sit up and start to take notice of their own paperwork. Madam Speaker, I trust uh, the advantages of this bill will be obvious to the House. Inevitably, uh, some won't see its virtues, but then, as uh, the old saying has it, a slight inclination of the cranium is as adequate as a spasmodic movement of one optic to an equinine quadruped utterly devoid of any visionary capacity. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I beg to move. Uh, Mr. Paul Flynn. I shan't detain the House, for I think a protest must be made against the linguistic chauvinism of the Honourable Gentleman's speech. He referred to English being the mother tongue of all members of this House, ignoring the native British languages that were spoken in this country when the speakers of Anglo-Saxon were howling pagan barbarians. If I was to speak in the language of this country, and if I was to say to you, Madam Speaker, one that April with a shout is thought, the drach the march appears it to the rock. I would respond to the Honourable Gentleman and say that is not in order in this House. With respect, Madam Speaker, I would say it is in order because the language I, is, I am speaking is English. It's the English of Chaucer referred to. And if I went on to quote in the beautiful language of Chaucer, I would be incomprehensible to you and every other member of the House, but I'm not allowed to use... I am allowed to use the language of Chaucer but I am not allowed to use the language of Wales, which is, which is understood by a very large number of people. Madam, this is the only parliament Wales has, yet the language of Wales, the language of Scotland, the ancient language of Ireland are forbidden in this house. There are parliaments that conduct their business in a dozen languages. And I make this point 
because of the comments made by the Honourable Gentleman and his bill, when he calls for plain English, should call for plain Welsh and, pay, and plain Gaelic and plain uh, uh, Irish Gaelic as well. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in his bill. As many of that opinion say, aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Uh, Joe Ashton, Angela Browning, Roger Evans, <laughs> Alan Howarth, Glenda Jackson, Liz Lynn, Roger Moat, Rod Richards, <laughs> Joan Wally, uh, David Willits, and myself, Madam Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Brandis. Yeah. One more. Plain language, Bill. Second reading, what day? 22nd of January, madam. 22nd of January. And that concludes our coverage from the British House of Commons for 1990.